Hi guys, uh, this is uh, David Villar and uh, welcome to this uh, next video in which uh, we are going to discuss the potential health issues associated with uh, cover crops that are used for beef cattle. Uh, these are uh, basically quick growing uh, sources of forage for livestock. Uh, they provide uh, grazing in the same year the crop is uh, seeded as opposed to having the land fallow which is uh, more prone to erosion. So what are the most common cover crops? Uh, the three most common groups are either legumes, uh, uh, cool or uh, warm season grasses and brassicas. As we can see at the bottom, some of the legumes such as uh, hairy vetch and uh, lupins are legumes that help to fix nitrogen in the soil and they work well as a cover crop but they would not be uh, recommended as a forage crop uh, because of uh, their toxicity to uh, cattle or horses. Uh, lupins are actually a good source of uh, protein and energy in livestock feeds, but their use is only limited to a few uh, species that are non-toxic, like the ones uh, shown here, uh, which is uh, white lupin. And there are uh, three other ones that you could also plant, like uh, narrow flower lupin, or the European uh, yellow lupin, or uh, the tarwi uh, lupins. So uh, if you want to make sure the lupin uh, species uh, that you are going to plant is safe for cattle, you want to make sure it's not one of the toxic ones. Now the other group of uh, cover crops are different brassica species such as uh, radish, uh, kale, rapeseed, turnips. Uh, these uh, provide high quality, high protein feed for cattle uh, with a lot of digestible dry matter, but they're too high in moisture and low in fiber, uh, meaning that you need to uh, uh, offer uh, other uh, dry feeds uh, to maintain a normal uh, uh, ruminal environment. And because they're low in the three, in three uh, trace elements, uh, copper, manganese, and zinc, you also need to plan for supplementing with a properly balanced uh, mineral. If you feed more than 75% of the total diet with brassicas, there are gonna be uh, problems that will be caused by some of the toxins uh, that are present in brassicas, uh, which uh, we will discuss uh, on the next uh, slides. And finally, we have to mention small grains like uh, barley, uh, oats, uh, rye, uh, wheat. And the problems with these uh, rapidly growing grasses is that they can lead to grass tetany, uh, which is attributed to a uh, magnesium deficiency, as uh, we will discuss uh, later. A good way to avoid some of the problems uh, by each one of these uh, cover crops is to mix them uh, to either dil uh, balance a deficiency or maybe to dilute the excess of the toxins in each one. For example, uh, mixing grasses with at least 30% of, uh, of the pasture with uh, legumes uh, will reduce the risk of uh, grass tetany. On this slide, we see a typical use of a cover crop. In this case, it is uh, rye grass that was uh, planted in a corn stalk field. Uh, you can see the corn plant uh, residues there. So let's uh, talk about the risk associated with each one of these uh, cover crops. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, brassicas. In terms of uh, nutrients, they're excellent uh, source of protein uh, and total digestible nutrients. Uh, but because they have such a high uh, moisture content of up to 90%, it's going to be difficult for cattle to eat enough uh, material to meet those uh, nutrient requirements and obviously maintain a healthy uh, rumen environment. As we mentioned before, th they are low in certain trace elements like copper, manganese, and zinc. Uh, so you need to provide those uh, supplements uh, to balance uh, a potential deficiency. By contrast, uh, they're very high in sulfur uh, with concentrations uh, greater than 0.3% uh, sulfur, and that makes them uh, prone to uh, polyencephalomalacia, which is a neurological disease uh, with blindness, ataxia, convulsions, head pressing, and obviously uh, death. Uh, canola uh, is uh, particularly high in sulfur, so you may want to check those uh, sulfur levels. Uh, and the amount in the water that uh, may, may also contribute to the total uh, sulfur intake. Another uh, toxin that uh, brassicas uh, can accumulate is uh, nitrates, and at levels above uh, 1,500 uh, parts per million of uh, dry matter, they can kill a cow. Uh, those nitrates uh, get converted into nitrites in the rumen. When, when they get absorbed, they convert uh, hemoglobin into uh, hemoglobin, uh, which cannot carry oxygen in the red cells. 
and that's why you also need to limit the intake by doing maybe a strip grazing and uh, provide those cattle with other uh, feeds uh, like dry hay or ideally uh, plant those uh, brassicas uh, with uh, grass species as a cover crop uh, mix. There are many other to uh, toxins that are present in brassicas that could cause uh, different syndromes. It's usually just one of them that happens in any one case and you will not really find combinations of them. Uh, we list the ones reported in the literature here and if you would like to see field cases uh, for some of these, I invite you to watch the video on toxicants for the GI tract. Uh, basically, I will just mention them here. Uh, brassicas uh, contain uh, glucosinolates that uh, become converted to uh, toxic metabolites in the rumen, like uh, isothionates that can cause uh, gastroenteritis. Uh, the thiocyanates uh, can be go goitrogenic. The uh, methyl cysteine sulfoxide gets converted to a substance uh, that produces uh, Hanes body hemolytic anemia. Uh, the nitriles uh, cause liver damage uh, that uh, usually results in a secondary type of uh, photosensitization. And finally, the tryptophan in the rumen becomes uh, 4-methylindole, and when it reaches the lung, it produces a pulmonary uh, emphysema. Now, with regards to the small grains, uh, they are relatively safe to use for beef cattle, uh, but they can also pose some risks such as uh, grass tetany, uh, ergot uh, poisoning, and nitrate uh, toxicity. Uh, these uh, grasses tend to be high in protein, moisture, potassium, but they're low in, mag in magnesium, calcium, and sodium. Spring calving uh, cows in early lactation have high requirements uh, for magnesium and calcium, because they share those uh, electrolytes uh, with uh, calves uh, through their milk. Affected cattle will uh, become uh, nervous, agitated, they may experience uh, muscle tremors, and if the, the, the deficiency is severe, uh, they will have uh, convulsions, ataxia, grinding of teeth, and unless uh, we treated them right away, they will definitely die. Ergot uh, poisoning is caused by the infection of the seed heads uh, by a fungus, uh, which is called uh, Claviceps uh, purpurea. Uh, what we see on the image is the esclerosia, or the ergot uh, bodies, uh, which are replacing the seed heads of, of infected uh, plants. And they produce uh, signs similar to those in, uh, of the endophyte in tall fescue, uh, which are basically secondary to uh, vasoconstriction of uh, peripheral blood vessels and that will cause uh, gangrene of the extremities, hyperthermia, heat stress, and uh, decrease in milk production. Now the other one is uh, nitrate poisoning that accumulates in many plant species, especially when nitrogen is uh, readily available, available uh, but, uh, but uh, plants are not able to ut utilize it. For example, when there is uh, drought conditions, and as we already said, uh, nitrates uh, convert to nitrates in the rumen, and when these ones uh, move into the blood, it converts uh, hemoglobin to methemoglobin, uh, which is unable to carry oxygen. And the clinical signs usually include uh, weakness, lethargy, incoordination, high uh, heartbeat and respiratory rate, and obviously the animal dies, and if you op open it up, you will see that the blood is, uh, is uh, looking like a dark chocolate. Now let's uh, say a few things about how to diagnose hypomagnesemia and how to treat it and prevent it. And the first thing is to say that low ma uh, magnesium also affects uh, calcium metabolism in two ways. The first one is uh, reducing uh, parathyroid hormone secretion uh, in response to hypocalcemia. And it also reduces the sensitivity of the parathyroid hormone, uh, which is shown in this slide. As you can see, when uh, magnesium is low, even if the parathyroid hormone binds to its receptor, uh, there is no production of uh, cyclic AMP uh, by the adenyl uh, cyclase uh, complex. And in a cow exhibiting uh, clinical signs of uh, tetany, uh, plasma manganese will be low, uh, but calcium also falls. In other words, uh, tetany only happens when both uh, plasma manganese and calcium uh, concentrations uh, decline. Uh, basically, with low uh, manganese, 
uh, sorry, uh, magnesium, there is no secretion of uh, uh, parathyroid hormone. And even if it, if it, if it was uh, normal, the receptor does not work uh, to maintain a normal ca uh, calcium homeostasis. So if uh, uh, parathyroid hormone doesn't work, uh, there is also no reabsorption of uh, magnesium in the kidney uh, tubules. What is the treatment of uh, clinical hypomagnesemia? Uh, this is an emergency and ideally we want to give those cows an IV dose of uh, 2 to 3 grams per cow of uh, magnesium and at the same time calcium solutions because as we said before calcium will also be low. Uh, for example, we can give uh, 400 ml of a 40% solution of uh, calcium borogluconate uh, plus, plus uh, 50 ml of a 25% solution of magnesium sulfate. And to prevent relapses, uh, we can repeat that treatment in 12 hours or we can give them an, a subcutaneous or, or, or an oral, uh, oral uh, source of uh, magnesium, uh, which will be obviously uh, slowly uh, absorbed. Now remember that uh, magnesium alone with, without calcium will not work, so we need to be, uh, those two need to be combined. And most uh, cows will respond in about one hour, which is the time it takes for that magnesium to be restored in the cere uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And as a prevention, there is no substitute better than supplementing uh, manganese salts uh, a few weeks before the times of uh, high risk and obviously prior to uh, grazing any uh, tetany prone uh, fields. Now moving on with the risk of uh, small grain grasses, uh, we have to talk about ergot uh, poisoning and even if uh, tall fescue is uh, not typically used as a cover crop, uh, the clinical presentation is the same one because the toxin is similar in both, so we're actually going to explain them together. Uh, the difference uh, is that uh, in tall fescue it is an endophyte inside the plant, so it's not visible with the, with the naked eye. Uh, whereas with uh, ergot, uh, it's a fungus that grows uh, in the seed head and produces what's called an esclerosium, uh, which is uh, what we see in the, as uh, those uh, hard block uh, masses uh, that look kind of like a mice uh, droppings. In uh, both tall fescue and ergot, uh, the main toxin is uh, ergobaline. And the pharmacological activity of these uh, alkaloids is attributed to the action on dopamine 2 receptors and the alpha 1 adreno, adreno uh, receptors uh, of the smooth, uh, smooth uh, muscle cells. As I say, the central uh, neurohormonal effects uh, mimic the effect of uh, dopamine at the pituitary, uh, which results in a reduction of uh, prolactin uh, secretion. And without prolactin, there is a drop in milk production and even a complete agalactia. At the smooth muscle cells, uh, whether they are uh, vascular or non-vascular, they act as uh, agonists of those alpha-1 adrenal receptors, and that results in a vasoconstriction of uh, peripheral vessels. Uh, there will be less blood going to the periphery, and uh, soft tissues in the limb, the toes, the ears, the tail, uh, they become deprived of blood supply and obviously they get uh, gangrene. Now the problems in cattle are different from horses. In cattle there are three syndromes that are called uh, fescue food, uh, bovine fat necrosis, and fescue uh, toxicity. So let's uh, talk about each one. Uh, which all of them can be traced back to the mechanism of action that we just uh, alluded at. Uh, the first one, fescue food, tends to happen in winter months when there is a cold temperature uh, that is already compounding the effect of the toxin uh, on blood supply to the extremities, uh, particularly the hind feet as we see on the image here. Uh, fat necrosis is characterized by the formation of necrotic uh, fat masses uh, in the abdominal cavity. It was uh, historically uh, known as uh, lipomitosis but now we know it's uh, neither uh, neoplastic nor uh, hyperplastic. And the clinical signs are uh, uncommon, but uh, sometimes they could cause uh, extra luminal uh, intestinal obstru obstructions, and they could also obstruct the birth uh, canal. And finally, uh, fasciotoxicosis uh, comprises a group of different signs, uh, starting by a re reduction in uh, feed intake, 
as we see in the table, uh, which is showing the percent of time steers spend grazing uh, during the daylight, uh, which is 52% in pastures with uh, low levels of endophyte, uh, compared with 34% in, in, uh, if uh, the fescue is high on the endophyte. And that's uh, because they cannot really cool off and then they spend more time standing in the water. That obviously uh, causes a decrease uh, in the weight gains. Uh, the animals have an elevated heart rate. They are uh, hyperthermic. Uh, there is a decreased uh, production of uh, prolactin, which uh, results in lower milk production and uh, rough and long hair coats uh, because they fail to shed those uh, winter hair coats. And in horses, uh, the main problems are reproductive. They may abort, but most often they have uh, prolonged gestations in which the foal uh, keeps uh, growing inside and the, and the mare will not be able to expel it on a normal uh, parturition. Uh, in other words, uh, there will be a dystocia or difficult birth and we need to assist those uh, mares in the delivery process. And because uh, serum prolactin levels will be extremely low, the mares uh, will have agalactia and will not be able to produce any milk. On this slide, we see the effect of the fungal endophyte on pregnant mares and foals uh, grazing tall fescue. Uh, the columns in green are fescue pastures uh, free of the endophyte, and the orange columns are the pastures infected with the endophyte. So if we move from the left to the right, all the 11 mares in either group carried all their foals uh, to term, but the ones exposed to the endophyte had uh, problems uh, foaling. Uh, 10 of the 11 mares could not produce milk, only 3 of the 11 uh, foals were uh, born alive, and only 2 of those uh, 3 uh, survived. And in the last uh, columns we see that uh, 3 of the 11 mares died during the parturition process. The best way to prevent all of this from happening is, is uh, removing those uh, gestating mares from infested pastures at least 3 months prior to uh, their uh, foaling. And the final group of uh, cover crops are different types of uh, legumes, but there are some risks associated with them. Uh, probably the one most uh, people are familiar with is uh, frothy uh, bloat. In general, alfalfa and clovers are uh, so rapidly digested that they form a stable foam uh, which accumulates in the rumen, and that increases the interluminal uh, pressure. And beyond clovers and alfalfa, other uh, legumes like peas and beans can also cause uh, bloat. Uh, we should never really give hungry animals access to uh, lush uh, clover or alfalfa stands, and ideally feed them dry hay or silage before you turn them out to graze. Uh, this will uh, basically slow down the rate of uh, fermentation in the rumen and will prevent them from uh, bloating. Uh, legume grass uh, forage uh, mixes with 50-50 uh, uh, each are relatively safe without great uh, concern for bloat. Uh, we can also provide uh, uh, bloat blocks uh, containing anti-foaming agents like uh, poloxylene, uh, which can be used as in uh, legume fields. And there are specific uh, toxicity issues with uh, certain legumes such as uh, hairy veg or uh, sweet clover that we're going to discuss uh, next. Uh, hairy veg is a good cover crop to enrich the soil, but it's very toxic to livestock and should never re, uh, recommend it uh, to be used as a forage. It can cause a systemic uh, granulomatose disease. Uh, this is uh, basically an intense uh, inflammatory reaction that affects uh, multiple tissues and organs. And also the pathogenic me mechanism is not clear. It is thought to be a type uh, 4 uh, hypersensitivity reaction. And the animal will typically show uh, subcutaneous swelling, skin lesions, hair loss, diarrhea, conjunctivitis, uh, reddish uh, urine, uh, weight loss, and even neurological signs that end up in death. The clinical signs develop uh, after grazing pastures for at least two to six weeks. And once the signs become apparent, uh, they die uh, between 10 and 20 days. Another uh, legume that is a good uh, cover crop is uh, sweet clover, which is uh, not a problem on, on the pasture. But when it's uh, cut and baled uh, during conditions of high moisture, uh, it can favor the proliferation of molds that metabolize the non-toxic uh, cumarin into dicumarol, uh, which prevents the vitamin K from recycling in the liver. 
So you get an anticoagulant effect uh, that may cause uh, hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhages uh, in affected cattle. Uh, so we should never really feed spoiled or moldy hay or silage. Uh, the toxic hay or silage needs to be consumed for several weeks, uh, but the time between consumption and the appearance of uh, clinical disease can uh, vary uh, greatly depending on the concentration of dicumeral. And, uh, the clinical signs are obviously relating to uh, hemorrhages that result from uh, faulty uh, blood co coagulation. As you can imagine, those uh, clinical signs can vary depending on uh, where the bleeding is taking place. If it is in the joint and muscles, the animal may be stiff and lame. If it is in the nasal cavity, they will exhibit uh, nose bleeding. Uh, they can have hematomas in areas of the trunk, the neck, the limbs. And death uh, is usually caused by massive uh, bleeding in a major uh, cavity uh, like uh, the thoracic cavity, the lungs, uh, the abdominal cavity, uh, the GI tract, and you name it. Now the treatment of choice uh, in affected cattle is to provide a whole uh, blood transfusions. Uh, this will immediately uh, correct the deficiency of clotting factors and the anemia to some degree. Uh, this is obviously difficult if you think that you may, uh, to be effective, you may need several gallons of uh, whole blood in a cow. In addition, all the affected animals should receive uh, parenteral administration of vitamin K1, uh, either uh, sub-Q or IM. And the reversal of dicumeral poisoning by uh, vitamin K1 uh, requires the synthesis of uh, coagulation factors, and that may uh, require more than 24 hours uh, uh, before they completely restore the uh, coagulation times. Obviously, you cannot continue feeding that spoiled hay or need to replace it with other feeds such as alfalfa or some uh, grass uh, legume hay mixture. And finally, I wanted to say that intoxications by anticoagulant rodenticides in small animals are almost identical to sweet clover in cattle. Uh, the mechanism of action is similar. They prevent uh, vitamin K1 recycling in the liver. Uh, that results in depletion of uh, clotting factors and the clinical signs and the treatment options are basically the same. Uh, a major difference is that in small animals uh, the rodenticide uh, may stay in the liver for weeks uh, up to a month so you may need to provide that vitamin K1 for at least a month until all that uh, rodenticide uh, out and gone uh, from the liver. So this is the final slide, guys. Thank you for uh, listening and watching. So I will uh, say goodbye until the next one.